Welcome to the OpEx Effect, a joint podcast from Excess Returns and Spot Gamma, where we take a deep dive into the world of options and the flows they generate in the markets. Join Brent Kachuba and Jack Forehand every month on Options Expiration Week as they look at the major developments in the options world and how they impact all of our portfolios. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of a little. So, Brent, I got to be honest, I'm a, I'm a little disappointed. I, I was told you'd be wearing the same outfit Warren Kitty wore in his live stream. Today, <laughs> um, but it appears you've gone with something a little more standard. I, I was thinking about this, uh, a bandana and some long hair, some sunglasses. Like sling, entire operation. Right. And then, uh, I mean, a lot of people probably think I just spew nonsense during all these uh, talks, but, um, you know, I could just well, spew a bunch did, of them. I think. Um, <laughs> that was super but, disappointing. Yeah, it's, it's funny. And we're going to be getting into this later. We're, we're going to sort of talk about what's been going on behind the scenes with that. But it is yeah. interesting. Like, you've been in markets a long time, just like I have. And I was thinking back, like, early in my career, did I ever think anything like this that happened? Like, a guy could tweet someone sitting forward in a chair and like a stock goes up hundreds of a percent. And then he does a live stream, like in a sling in this crazy outfit and it goes back down 40%. I'm like, I don't think I could have ever seen this coming. Yeah. It's just, it's unbelievable, but it's still happening. I, I'm totally with you that in, you know, 2021, like it, it, the original meme mania really set the stage for this. And the guy comes back and there's this energy and he's like, okay, you know, like the SEC or not the SEC, like there, there's some investigations on him and he's got, you know, he's like got the market corner and it's this whole thing. And then he just lets the air out of the balloon um, and the excitement just dies. Uh, it, it's just it's just such a bizarre thing. Um, and even it's more serious. bizarre, sorry, even more bizarre is that people just keep losing money, you know, on this. Thing. Yeah, it's no, like the retail so. crowd. And and you can yell at them. You can stand at, at the top of a mountain and say, please stop doing this. You know, take your gains. Here are all the reasons why this is a bad idea. Uh, people don't care. So, you know, um I've learned a lot of lessons this week. I would say, you know, that one, you can continue to pound the table on retail will continue to do maybe not the smartest things, or at least a good chunk of them. And then the second one is that performance really doesn't matter in terms of getting assets. Uh, and in, for any of that, you can look at the call overriding funds that continue to grab uh, giant amounts of money. And you're in the RIA space uh, and deal with performance a lot. So you probably know that as well. Like top performance doesn't mean you're going to get the most uh, assets, right? No, no, not at all. Yeah, sorry for that little segue, but <laughs> no, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's unfortunate though because you know retail. It, I mean, it's basically like casino. The retail is on the wrong side of them, and they keep losing. Ken Griffin gets another yacht, and we and we move on with our lives. Um, yeah, but yeah. it's not the way you want it to play out, ideally, you know. Yeah, and, and what got me on this diatribe is is I went to the EQ Derivatives Conference, which is a pretty big derivatives conference, and and there was a lot of these call overriding funds that were really gleaming. Uh, you know, they're super happy about the amount of assets they're gathering, and, and good for them. Um. For example, they have a call overriding fund in NVIDIA, which we're going to talk about here. Um, and, you know, it's got $3 billion in assets, but it underperforms the stock on basically every, you know, one year, six month, three months, because you just keep capping your gains by selling calls against it, uh, against the stock, you know? And so um, doesn't matter, you know, dividend, you, know, you get this dividend or yield from it. And uh, this thing keeps gathering assets and, you know, doesn't uh, doesn't actually help you out on a total return basis. But yeah, we- But anyway... It, it was interesting though. We had our, we had someone on the podcast who was talking about one of these call overriding funds on excess returns recently, and he was saying like if it's something like these monthly call overriding funds like capture like forty percent of the upside of the stock or something. It's like they're missing a ton of upside with what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, and and those are they're selling weekly calls against these positions now, um, and we're going to talk a bunch about Nvidia, so this is relevant. And we're also, you know, we, we talked we had a, a presentation before about volatility suppression and one of the big things were, were these systematic call overriding funds and those are important now because we're choking on a whole bunch of gamma here in the s p 500 which is keeping the market pretty pinned and that segues us into this opex conversation so our little uh segue here i think it's all relevant or all tied back in um, yeah, but we'll yeah bring, to- we'll bring gamestop back in at the end here or a little bit further in the podcast but first we always start with the opex cycle um how it works and what it means for investors yeah and so the way that we we view this is that generally speaking, uh, thirty days every thirty days is this OPEX cycle. And I say generally because now some of these stocks like Nvidia and the, and the biggest you know Mag Seven names, et cetera, it's almost like a weekly cycle or GameStop. But basically, positions build up into expiration, uh, typically third Friday of the month, and then you also have the quarterly expiration where the really big hedge funds uh, and funds out there, generally speaking, will put their positions. Um, and so as we get closer to the bigger expirations. Uh, positions build up, the hedges related to those positions build up. I think the options market gains more control over the you know relevant asset or whatever it may have a, uh, a big options complex. Uh, 
And then when those positions expire, it shifts the underlying flows. So we have some stats in here. We could talk about that, but you can think about the S&P, for example, which has had very, very low volatility. It's just been grinding higher. Um, and as it grinds higher, there are these giant call positions that are going to expire. And when those call positions expire, it frees the S&P up for some movement and for some volatility, uh, which generally leads to a little bit of consolidation. I have some stats to talk about that uh, fresh off the uh, stat oven, so to speak, as well. <laughs> yeah, and what's, what's interesting in your next slide here is, you know, we had in the, in the grind up we've had, we had a lot of OPEXs that weren't a big deal in terms of the market, but then the last two ago was a significant bottom in the market. And then the last one, there was like a, a little pullback. Um, so we've had, we've had a couple more relevant ones, you know, recently than we had during that, during that uh, increase in the market. Yeah. Uh, April OPEX, which we're going to touch on, just another thing we're going to touch on here in this presentation. Um, April OPEX, the Friday was the low. And if you think about April, we, we had such a hot market into the end of March, right? Beginning of April. And then all of a sudden, we had geopolitical circumstances pick up. Inflation started to get people nervous. And S&P dropped 5%. And NVIDIA and all these other stocks that had just been ripping had a giant drop, a giant nasty drop. I'll detail in a minute. That's the day of options expiration uh, in April was the low. We rallied into May options expiration, had a little bit of a consolidation, as you mentioned. And now we've rallied a very strong rally here over the last couple of weeks. After inflation showed it had cooled and the Fed kind of got out of the way, now we're at all-time highs, 54.50-ish in the S&P right now. Qs are up around 480-ish uh, as we head into this big quarterly expiration. Is it more likely to get a turning point, like when you get a major move into one of these? Like one of the things I noticed on a lot of these Xs that were turning points is like the, the move before it was pretty significant um, coming in. Yeah, and, and I think that relates to the size of positions that build up. So so the the faster the market rises uh, or the more it goes up, the bigger call positions get, for example, then there's more to unwind. Just like when the market is crashing like it did into April and you have all these put positions on and those put positions get wiped out, well, the hedging flows uh, and the pressure to push the market down is relieved and that oftentimes can lead to these uh, you know significant bounce. So that imbalance is really what's critical. And in this case, we are very, very uh, call heavy as we're going to outline. Um, and so the market's had a big rally and I think that it's time for just a breather, right? Some consolidation here before, uh, before I think ultimately the market returns uh, higher, but, but first we got to get some consolidation here. So on this next one, this, this topic of the zone is something we've covered on a lot of these and you're, you're seeing a little bit of a different zone. Obviously the zone keeps going up and keeps the market's going, going up, yep. but, uh, we, we've got, nonetheless, we do have a zone. Yeah. It's a cadence. It roll. You can watch it roll. Uh, some of the things that we detail on our site. Um, you know, consistently you can watch these levels move up. And then when there's certain levels that break, it, it generally to us signals that there's a high volatility, a likelihood of high volatility going forward. So that high volatility trigger right now is down at 5,300. There's a lot of long puts at that strike. If we break that level, I think you got a lot of volatility. But right now we're 3% above that, right? So we, got, we have some good padding. Um, 5,450 SPX, which ties roughly 545 in the spiders. Uh, 545 spiders in particular, very, very big level. And so, you know, there's this just this big call positions, short dated, you know, zero DTs being sold, as well as the monthlies that are coming up on Friday. We have Juneteenth, the holiday coming up on Wednesday. So today, which is Monday, tomorrow, which is Tuesday, we just think that we're really just wrapped up in this tight gamma position uh, at these big strikes. And when we wipe out that gamma, I think it leads to a testing of certainly 5,400 well, I shouldn't say certainly. There's nothing certain about any of this stuff, but <laughs> uh, but 5400 is kind of support, and I think we could end up testing maybe that 5300, and that would be a good spot for uh, for a bounce. But the idea is here: we're about to lose one third of the positions that you see in your screen. In orange, there are call positions, and in blue are put positions. And so you can see the orange bars on a relative basis are just much larger. And I assume the uh, the two lines all off by themselves to the left is probably 5,000. I can't see the chart, but uh, that's it. Always seems the round number. That's Always exactly that's right. Of yeah, yeah. And and there was a lot of what's called box trades or financing trades, which are, don't have a market impact. Um, but but I think those were all struck down at 5,000. And then it's just that big round number, which adds to those positions. And so that's going to be a key strike for some time. Uh, and I also think it's going to be a major support area um, into the future. If you're talking about like a really nasty, you know, worst case scenario right now, particularly in the end of the month, you have huge positions at 5,000, and then that JP Morgan collar trade that everyone talks about that comes up at the end of the month, that struck at 49.75. And so I think that is a huge support area. That's 10%-ish, 8 to 10% from where we are today. So I don't think that gets tested now by the end of the month. 
but at least into the end of this month, you know, that's your kind of, I think, worst case scenario. Um, you know, you get the French issues, which seem to be cooling off a little bit. Uh, there's not a whole lot of catalysts to break us down like that. Um, is the, uh, but, is the JP Morgan thing less impactful now? Like just as someone like me outside of the options, you know, market, I don't really hear about it as much. At one point I was hearing about it all the time and yeah. I seem to hear about it as much. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows it's there. Uh, the dealers know that everyone knows it's there. So I think it kind of gets disguised a little bit. It is a lot of Delta, uh, for the market. It's a lot of gamma for the market. But ultimately when you talk about particularly the upside strike that gets sold, which is up around 55, 50. Uh, that adds a lot of positive gamma to the market. And so that area, that 55.50-ish, I think is a reasonable uh, high to consider for the end of the month. Even if we get a brief pullback next week, you have to circle that on your you know, strike calendar, so to speak, as an upside area because there's still a lot of gamma there. Now that gamma just figures into all the other gamma, you know, which is related to calls being sold, right? If you're talking about the JEPI fund, the JEPI fund, and you know all these other call overriding schemes, there's 300 or excuse me about 200 billion dollars uh, associated with these derivative overriding uh, funds and and that's a lot of hedging flows related to that and as we outlined in a recent video called volatility suppression you can uh, watch that video just google uh, excess returns volatility suppression or spot gamma volatility suppression and you'll come up with that video but we detailed how those call overriding funds are squashing uh S&P volatility specifically so Back to your point, the JP Morgan fund, I think, does have this kind of day-to-day -day impact. As far as it being this strike you have to watch on this day, I've looked at the stats. There's nothing that you can conclusively draw from that. Um, and look, it only applies to quarterly expirations, and there's been three years of it. So you got like 12 to 15 data points, right, which is it's yeah. hard to get uh, you know, a lot of concrete data out of, of what that impact of that strike is or those strikes It seemed are. like, you know, a while back we, we were pinning at those strikes sometimes, but it seems like now it's not, not the issue it once was. We, we haven't, we just haven't been in the neighborhood of those strikes. Okay. Um, you know, we've been just blowing like through them. If you were in the neighborhood of them. You, you would expect some pinning into the end of the month. So those okay. positions expire at the end of the quarter, right? So there's the we we call it the quarterly expiration, which is the third Friday here, but but technically it's just a big monthly expiration. It just is landing on the quarter. The technical quarter expiration is the last day of June, and that's when those J.P. Morgan collar positions expire. And if we get into that neighborhood of fifty five fifty at the end of this month, then it becomes a pinning area, right? Because there's so much decay happening, uh, and we should sort of draw into and around that strike. Uh, but you know, it's it's a horseshoes and hand grenade situation. We're not going to pin to that specific level because there's so many positions shifting, et cetera. Uh, but it's kind of a hey, this is a magnet, you know, region regional magnet, so to speak. So in our in our next slide, our excitement from a couple opexes ago is is over. Um, we are we are to the right again in this chart. Yeah, we're all the way here to the to the right. There's a big positive gamma environment as we mentioned here, and what this chart is showing you is our gamma estimate, which is in red. So we look at the amount of gamma that's in the market, and then we back out how much volatility we think should be in the S&P on a one-day basis. Um, and this is forward volatility. So given you know the gamma from last night, what should the market do today in terms of volatility, S&P? And you can see they're very tightly correlated. And what this chart is showing you uh, is that right now, the forward return expectation, uh, whether you look at our model or whether you look at just what zero DTE options are pricing or even one-week options are pricing, you're pricing in no volatility, um, and you can extrapolate that really into you know one month ahead, two month ahead, et cetera. There is no volatility in the S&P, and no one is looking for volatility in the S&P. Now, what will happen is on Friday, a third, as I mentioned, of gamma positions are set to expire, so we're going to naturally slide to the left on that chart that you're seeing here, which infers that we should get bigger trading ranges, right? Um, and so that is the kind of interesting thing that we set up for here is like, if you want to add your, some of your equity positions, if you want to do some shifting of some positions, maybe you want to trim a little bit of your longs here or do some call overriding and then look to opportunistically uh, buy some dips that maybe come up next week. Yeah, what's interesting about this, and this is something I've thought about as we've done this these episodes over and over, is like this is one day volatility is fairly predictable. I mean, your, your estimates are, are very close to what actually happens if you look at this. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing here is oftentimes the market settles into that. You have a volatility event, right? And it takes a while for that that echo of volatility, the autocorrelation, or we want to cut it to, to 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 shrink back down. Um and so, you know, these are the opportunities where maybe the market doesn't price in the impact of options expiration, right? 
Um, and so, you know, there'll be maybe a little bit of edge or there'll be times where volatility gets priced so low that it can't go any lower. It can't possibly go any lower. You know, this is kind of the situation that we saw uh, back in the start of April or back even a little bit into middle of May. We haven't gotten there yet, um, but we are hitting this point where OPEX should shake things up. And then I think over the summer, we hit kind of like a 2017 style volatility crunch where people are just waiting on the elections. Inflation is not today or tomorrow's problem or even this month's problem. Um, and so, you know, realized volatility just really, I think, squashes. Uh, I think that's what I have on the menu for, for kind of July, August time frame. So taking a look at the June expiration, it is, you can see on this chart, it's a big one. It big, uh, oops, sorry about that. It is in line with March um, in December. So this isn't like the biggest quarterly expiration we've ever had, but you know, it's very large. It's about three times larger than May's expiration, which is a regular monthly expiration. And here, what you can really notice is this is the size of the Delta position expiring for uh, the S&P, the NASDAQ, and the Russell combined. And, and as you can see, it is extremely weighted in calls. Um, there's almost no put positions on right now, or, or I should say the put positions have almost no value whatsoever. And so this is very, you know, this is that imbalance we're talking about that generally we believe statistically it supports this idea that next week we'll get really starting, I think on Thursday, we could start to get a little bit of equity consolidation, uh, S&P or Q's maybe just pull back. Um, and then I think uh, into the start of July, we start to rally again. Is the imbalance towards calls, is that like the biggest we've seen this year in, in the ones we've looked at? It's Are similar to the size of March. Uh, again, um, you know, March was a big expiration. We rallied hard and or very sharply into that expiration. And um, and so it is a it's a pretty similar look. And so, um, you know, you, you have this evidence of, of these recent expirations where you get this imbalance. And this is not necessarily marking an equity top. It is marking, again, a time for uh, for consolidation as related hedging flows need to unwind and, and sort of just readjust. So yeah, on this next slide, you have some interesting stats here about OPEX in general. Yeah, so I went back and I, and, I, and I looked at how often this OPEX flip takes place, right? And the idea is that if we're strong into options expiration the week of, what happens to the market typically the next week? And what we find is two-thirds of the time, the S&P flips after OPEX. So if we're strong into OPEX week, we tend to be weak, weak the week after. The market tends to go down the week after. And vice versa, if we crash into OPEX, we tend to rally the week after. And what I also found was interesting about is that is that is much stronger when you look at uh, whether there's a VIX expiration before uh, after, right? So two thirds of the time, 68% specifically, we flip if VIX expiration occurs the week after. Uh, the performance of that OPEX flip drops pretty sharply to only about 58% if VIX expiration occurs the week before options expiration. So those two are so somewhat linked in the stats that I found. The other thing that's interesting about this that I thought is that there's just this indication that volatility, generally speaking, expands. Um, you can see here in the blue line, this is before options expiration. The distribution of returns is pretty normal, right? It's a, that's about as bell-shaped as you can get. Of course, there's a little bit of a left tail there. Uh, but what we see in the week after options expiration is that distribution widens out. Um, interestingly, you can see there's a little bit of maybe a a positive market tilt return on here. Some of that is because some of the biggest bounces we've had is after uh, periods of real weakness, right? I think what, when you get the market really dropping sharply into options expiration, it's it's often, you can really kind of depend on that market bounce the week after. Um, so OPEX being kind of like a low and a crash cycle. Uh, but in this case, you can see that the tails widen out, volatility just kind of winds out. Um, and this data here, I believe is based on the last five years of data. So it's a pretty good data set. Uh, for the modern options complex. So before we talk about what's moving, um, we're going to talk about some more GameStop there. Um, we want to talk about what moved. We always want to talk about what we talked about in the previous episode and, and look at how it actually played out. Yeah, and and so I, I was going back into our options as a conversation and I, and I remember our, our, our review and it was sort of like, look, it's very hard. Like we're at just this sort of pivot point. Um, NVIDIA earnings was coming up. That was going to be the big turning point. And there was a bunch of inflation data. And so, um, you know, it was the waiting game is what we called it. And that was the name of the slide. So what you can see here is we rallied over 5,200 and, you know, into that May options expiration. And then we had VIX expiration after we got a little bit of equity weakness after May options expiration after a strong rally. And then it was NVIDIA earnings that popped, right? Very strong earnings out of NVIDIA. Um, that moved the whole market up. And then the inflation data just proved to be pretty benign. And that really gave the the next leg of the kicker. And so 
what you could see in this chart as we outlined that there's your May expiration. We kind of got a little bit weaker after that. Uh, then you get NVIDIA earnings as well as that inflation data. And we just rallied very sharply right off that 5,200 number. Uh, and obviously we're up in the 4450, 4450, uh, 4440, 4450 area uh, today. And, and so, you know, this new June options expiration, this is a turning point, I think, you know, similar to, to May where we're setting up, I think, for We've been pinning, right? We're getting this very straight sideways market right now. And I think we'll get, again, that consolidation before we rally uh, into July. This is this next slide is something we've talked about a lot here, which is this idea of cross-asset volatility. Um, yeah, what do you yeah. think there? Cross-asset volatility, you know, one of the knocks on on my general view that zero DTE flow and uh, these call overriding programs are suppressing volatility is that, look, volatility across all assets has been pretty... Uh, weak or or, or small, um, and that goes for uh, international equities as well as uh, commodities, rates, et cetera, as you can see here. We now had some issues in France, right, where vol has flared up there last week, and Europe has gotten quite a bit weaker, particularly last week. They had some pretty big drawdowns, uh, but S&P stayed extremely stable through that period, right? And this is only just last week. So while cross-asset vol was lower, uh, we put an RIP on that because things are moving. I think oil's come down a little bit. I don't know that vol's moved all that much. Gold and silver have had, you know, some some pops in volatility. They remain kind of high. Credit started to get a little bit of shakiness uh, with some of these uh, French issues uh, or issues in France. But, you know, by and large, still in the realm of things, volatility is pretty quiet uh, cross asset um, across the globe. And, and so... Um, you know, it's just very interesting to point out that that's an environment where, in, you know, globally, and as people start to cut rates like Europe and, and people are looking for the rate cuts in uh, in the U.S., um, you know, we'll see if this low volatility uh, stance remains. Yeah, it's interesting that gold kind of stands on its own right now, um, you know, in terms of its volatility mm -hmm. relative to everything else. Yeah, I think it vols actually, I need to fact check this, but I think it's, act, I mean, it's vols certainly near Bitcoin vol. Bitcoin vol has just been coming down quite a bit, which has been really interesting. Um, it's hard to think of as Bitcoin as, as more of a stable asset, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's starting to starting to really become so. Um, you know, and I think that gold vol is going to likely remain elevated is, is, is what my hunch is. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see about some of these other, uh, I, I'm, I'm, let, I'm more ignorant on some of these other things like, you know, the credit markets and FX vol. I just know that if credit market vol starts to pick up, that oftentimes is a harbinger of a big spike in equity vol. So I keep a look, uh, you know, I keep an eye on it because I think that's when the biggest vol spikes hit. Um, and so that's why you start to watch, you know, some of the issues in France. They seem to be quieting down a little bit this week. Uh, but you know, you can see situations where French banks have problems and that leaks into the U.S., right? Um, everything is linked, obviously. So, you know, you keep a side eye on that. But overall, the S&P just sort of volatility in the S&P just didn't care um, writ large. And you can see that here uh, in this chart. This is the term structure. Uh, and, and what you can see here is we were a little bit elevated before Powell, you know, this, this past week, um, excuse me, uh, last month. Uh, this is what this chart is from. We said, hey, look, you know, there's a little worry around Powell, but long-term rates, and this is, again, S&P term structure, imply volatility is as low as it's been over the last 90 days, which is what that cone is. And so what you're seeing here is the market saying, we're not worried about the future, and that has played out, right? The future has given the market no concern. Volatility stayed very low. That's the situation we were in. We'll show you that's still the situation that we're in now. People are really not pricing in a lot of high high volatility going forward until maybe the election. And I think that is likely to still be the case, right? I don't think there's going to be any major policy changes or anything else going on at this point uh, over this summer period before uh, before we get into the election season. What's interesting to me too, and we've talked about this in the podcast, is this idea of dispersion that, you know, equity vol is low, but beneath the surface, there's been a decent amount going on. I mean, is, we, we're like small cap value managers. So we yeah. hold like a small cap portfolio and like the experience of that on a day-to-day -day basis has been very different than the experience of the S&P 500, both up and down. It is very true. Uh, we have a chart on that here um, as well, and, and I can just pop that real quick on that on that point. Um, this is the IWM. Just over the last month, IWMs are down 4%. They're under this key 200 level now, uh, whereas s and is up 4% over that same period, and the Qs are up 8, right? So, you know, this is the correlation 
you know dispersion trade that has really become a, a hot topping uh, hot hot topic lately um because you know depending on what stocks you specifically own you're having a wonderful year or you could be having a very bad year um and so you know it's so interesting as as we uh look into things i mean i think people are concerned that higher for longer or just rates are likely to remain stable um so you know the big mega cap ai companies say great we have this growth we don't really care about the financing because we're making so much money uh, is the kind of the layman's view of this thing, whereas the, as the small caps go, uh oh, like we're not getting a rate break anytime soon. And I think that's really, I mean, that's my view of what's weighing on this. Uh, you probably have a better lens on that than I would. Yeah, no, it's your it's your point about you know the different markets, like, and we're gonna get talk about Nvidia in a second here. Like, it was a someone had published a, a number like a couple of days ago about the percentage of the S and P's increase this year that is due to just that one stock. Yeah, it's it's a very big number. It's a surprising. I forget exactly what there, it was, but it, 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 it's in, depending on what time frame you're like, talking about, uh, it's about thirty five percent of this year's returns are are Nvidia. And on my on, on the screen here is this is just the last month. Nvidia's up forty percent versus the spiders is up two and a half percent. I mean, it's just, uh, it's crazy. And you know, a lot of this, we had we we've done a little bit of work. If you look at when Tesla and Apple split, uh, those stocks did so well in August of two thousand twenty one, and then around the Wednesday, you know, the start the month of June, those stocks both got a little bit weaker. Um, excuse me, September they got a little bit weaker back in uh, August two thousand twenty one. And the idea being that the split opened the stock up for a bunch of retail investors and there was a little bit of a rush in. Uh, NVIDIA's had an incredible month. They had a really good week last week. Stocks are on 130 right now. I think that the stock on a relative basis is the outperformance is going to start uh, coming in. Um, and I have some options reasons for that that we could touch on in a moment. But what was interesting is at the end of uh, May... Um, on a one, this is one month options here, and and skew was just very flat. That's what you can see here in this in this teal line, and and flat skew tells us that there's not a big demand for call options, right? If you see skew like it was in mid March when the stock was really moving high, they had the GTC conference, people were really excited about, and when you see that skew looking like a bike ramp, right, or a ski jump, that's telling you there's a lot of demand for out of the money calls, right? That's a sign of obviously you know bullish fervor, and you know, if you find a mild call skew, so a little bit of a ramp, you generally oftentimes want to get in into that stock, I think, because it tells you that people are buying calls and if the stock starts to rally, dealers and market makers may have to buy that stock with you. That's kind of gamma squeeze stuff, right? If you get in a situation where the ramp is like, you know, gold medal ski jump ramp and you stand at the top and you're like, oh gosh, like this is too scary. That's generally a sign that things are overbaked, right? They're too expensive. We're going to talk about GameStop and I'll show you exactly what that means. But it just means that if the stock has moved up a lot, options start to price that in and more. And so the likelihood that calls pay off decreases, right? Because the dealers and market makers widen out prices, gives them more padding, gives them more edge, and it makes the likelihood that the calls that everybody else owns are going to pay off. Um, and so it's a sign of basically overbought. Now, as it turns out, NVIDIA had great earnings um, and that re-energizes some of the call positions. Um, as you can see on your screen here. And so it's had another just banger of a month for NVIDIA. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, why that's got a little bit too rich in our view uh, in some of the coming slides. Yeah, so it's interesting to me. Like NVIDIA, um, you know, it's just how, I, mean, I didn't even know how well it's done. Like it's, I knew it had been on a big wrong recently, but like, this is crazy. Um, but also what's interesting is that the business is doing, I mean, it's a very expensive stock by, yes. by any standard, but the business has done really, really well. Like, this is not some meme stock, you know, going up like crazy with no fundamentals. Like, yeah. the thing has been, the business has been crushing it recently. It, it's crushing it, no doubt about that. Uh, but if you compare the NVIDIA market cap to Apple and Microsoft, which is, you know, NVIDIA, depending on the day, and Apple just had a nice pop, so I think it regained number two, maybe even number one. So those are jockeying. You know, the the, the market caps are multiples higher in, in Apple and Microsoft versus NVIDIA, right? So NVIDIA is all about forward guidance and, and future expectations more so than what it's printing now, right? Um, because NVIDIA is still not an odd lot relative to the Apple and Microsoft market caps, uh, but, you know, it's certainly not the same size. Uh, so there's a lot of forward expectations. And, you know, I, I'm not a fundamental guy, um, so I, I can't get into, you know, the, the moat that NVIDIA has or whatever, but I can tell you that my view is largely that when you look at the NVIDIA complex, you have these double, triple ETFs, which, okay, look, granted, they're 
you know, they, they have $5 billion in, in those ETFs. You have a massive call options complex, but NVIDIA is, you know, top two or three in the S&P. It's 25% of the SMH. It's a huge component of the XLK. It's a top, I don't know what it is in the queues right now, but top, probably top five. So uh, in terms of its index position, so the entire system, right, all the assets that are being gathered, all this momentum uh, that show up in the U.S. equity market, so much of that energy goes into NVIDIA. And so as the momentum continues, there are all these dollars that essentially are, are there just to chase that momentum higher, right? Uh, and that's explicit in terms of levered products or call options, but it's also in, look, every 10 bucks that goes into the S&P, you know, three, four, five, six bucks of that has to go right into NVIDIA, right? And that continues to grow uh, because of the momentum the stock has had. Um, and so I think that's what generates it as a little bubble. Is it the best stock or has the best growth in the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ? Great. Should that, is that warranted? I think so. But it should have been up, you know, 10% maybe this quarter as opposed to 40. I, you know, that that's where I start to maybe throw the flag here a little bit. So as as we shift to uh, our, our What's Moving session, I guess we'll talk a little bit about GameStop here because it's it's been interesting for me, like being on the sidelines. Um, you know, I, I guess the way this played out is sort of what I thought, even though I'm not an expert in this. Like, I figured they weren't going to be able to do what they did the previous time. Like, 2021 wasn't going to happen again. There's a lot of smart people in the market that saw that happen. And probably did not want to see that happen again. Yeah. So I guess what what kind of happened is what we would have expected, right? I mean, a smaller version of what happened in 2021. Hundred percent. So 2021, the the retail community for a variety of reasons have been covered, you know, extensively, caught the market making, and I would just say the sell side writ large off guard, right? Everybody knew that when retail comes in, you fade the retail rally and and you make a bunch of money, and that retail rally had more legs to it than anyone had ever expected. You can't get the jump on on the sell side, particularly market makers, the same way anymore, right? That's a story that's as, you know, they're onto that game. So in this case, I'm going to pop out of the presentation to show a few screens. One of the things that, one of the best ways, I think, to watch, you know, for overbought conditions is in, in SKU, which I just mentioned for NVIDIA and implied volatility. And so on this chart here, I have current SKU for NVIDIA. And what you can see is that it looks kind of like a cup, you know, maybe like the Big Dipper a little bit. Uh, and you can see, you know, vols are, if you draw a line over, about 180%, which is very high. If you uh, break that down on a daily return basis, that's the market's pricing in 10 to 12% daily moves in GameStop, which is pretty high, right? But GameStop lately is moving that. So vol's still elevated, but for for GameStop now, this ball is not all that crazy, right? <clears throat> if you compare that to two previous times on your screen here, and this is looking at one month basis, you can see that in March, uh, that implied vol was up in the three, four hundred percent area. Um, this is in in March was when we first rallied. So if I show you the chart here, excuse me, in May, uh, the stock was pushing fifty, sixty dollars a share, right? And that what happened is as soon as that name started to squeeze. All of a sudden, that implied vol got jacked up. And what happens when that implied vol gets into the three, four, five hundred percent range? It almost doesn't matter what the move in the stock does anymore because the options are pricing in such a massive move, right? That those calls can't possibly pay off on a prob on a probability basis anymore. So, in other words, as a market maker, I, Jack, I'll sell you a fifty strike game stock call or a hundred strike game stock call. Uh, I'll sell them to you all day long. I'm just going to charge you. 50 or $100 for that call, right? So it takes the stock doubling in order for it to pay off. And so your odds of getting that to pay off, you know, just, they're, they're so small. And when you jack up that implied volatility and retail will still pay those prices, the market makers make a ton of money. And then the second thing is when you jack up that implied vol, there's a lot of people like volatility funds and smarter options traders that want to come out and sell calls as well, right? Because you go, these calls will never pay off. I'm happy to sell those. And when they do that, that also takes a little bit of the pressure off the market makers. But basically, the other way to think about this is when the options market starts to say, hey, the probability of this event happening, you know, of the stock doubling from 50 bucks is going to zero, that is usually a point where the stock is is peaked out, right? Um, and so, again, when you look at this implied ball here in, in May, in gray, you can see it's exactly where we got into the three, 400% implied ball area. That's where the stock topped out, right? We well, can look at the exact same thing here uh, a week or two ago when the stock did the same thing. You know, the day before Roaring Kitty's, you know, infamous webinar on, on Friday, 
these implied vols for short dated options were in the 1200% area, right? Because he was going to come out and say some stuff the next morning. So these vols just got so crazy that it's like, look, there, there's no way these, these calls can pay off anymore because implied volatility has gotten so crazy. And so just like almost, it was like a microcosm of, you know, when the FOMC comes up, right? And the options are hedging that event. It's the same thing. There's what we call event vol. So generally, if Jerome Powell comes out, he says his thing, and vol tends to contract, right? Because Jerome Powell didn't say, hey, we're going to raise rates 10% and the market crashes. Well, Roaring Kitty, everyone's waiting for him to say something really exciting, and so vol was really high. And then as soon as he just comes out and goofs around for 20 minutes, implied vol drops like a rock because they realize like he doesn't have some trick up his sleeve, and then the expectations really crash. And when those ex expectations crash, call values crash, and all of a sudden there's a lot of hedging flows that unwind to sort of zap the stock what's interesting too is like put values to some degree went down as well like given certain put positions if you had bought them at the peak of the implied volatility you lost money right because of because of the crush that came after yeah so the the kind of ninja move so to speak and in, in, in options there's a lot of different expirations and strikes and things you could sell but when a stock is having a massive what we call stock up vol up move which is essentially what this is right call calls are going you know, are ramping, people are buying tons of them, and vol is going up as the stock is going up. The interesting trade is to put on a sell put or bet on stock coming down and vol coming down in kind. And so depending on exactly how you position, it's not too hard to sort of play around and figure this out, but you can sell puts in this situation um, so that if the stock comes down, well, vol comes down so much as well that your put position starts to pay off. And the put values get to be so expensive in some cases that you could sell, you know, 20 strike puts for like 10 bucks, which is basically betting that GameStop would have to go out of business essentially uh, over the coming, you know, months, right? Um, and generally, these aren't very short dated options. You can get away with that. But, you know, when these spreads widen out, you'll see retail people putting bids and offers in that can get a little noisy as well. And so, you know, those are the interesting ways to try to play this, right? Because um, the other thing is if Roaring Creek does pull off the ladder squeeze or whatever these guys want to call it, well, I'm happy to be in short puts in that situation as well. Um, so, you know, there's always these interesting opportunities that open up for options traders when, you know, vol just gets this crazy, right? When the options prices just get this crazy. Uh, but the takeaway, I think, for, for the audience here is, broadly speaking, that when you're trying to figure out, hey, is this overdone? You can look at some technicals, um, but when you just look at the, the volatility market, right, you can really glean a lot of extra information and understand that, hey, um, this is this stock is now fighting a real uphill battle. Once that momentum is lost, it's very hard to regain it, particularly when the cat's out of the bag, right? Okay, Roaring Kitty's positions for June OPEX have been by and large closed. Um, in fact, if you look at this tweet here, we have this system called Hero. And what Hero does is it shows you when big call or put positions are being bought and sold. And so you can see last week here, our purple red line goes down sharply. Uh, and that is Warren Kitty selling off all his calls. They were expensive calls because they were deep in the money. But what you can note from that is the stock went down first. And so what I think happened is there's a dealer managing this position for Warren Kitty because it's so large. Uh, they unwind some stock hedge by selling off some stock. And then the uh, the options get sold after that. And now I think Warren Kitty has something like a $9 million stock position. Uh, I don't know why that's supposed to be good for the stock, but you know that's what the situation is. is. And then not only at all that, we would just say that, you know, Ryan Cohen's a pretty well known in the options space uh, for being a pretty savvy guy. He's a, he's a CEO of Chewy as well. Um, he pulled a lot of interesting options moves in Bed Bath & Beyond back in, I think it was April, it was August of 2021, where he sold calls into uh, Mania. Um, and in this case, what he did is he directed GameStop to sell 75 million shares into the $60 stock price, right? When this ball is going crazy. Uh, so this is the guy who understands it. So you have the options market and the volatility complex really stepped up now in GameStop. I think that limits the moves. You had GameStop itself selling shares of stock, you know, as much as they can uh, smartly, I think, into this uh, rally. And then, you know, I don't know what else would possibly be a catalyst in this situation uh, for the stock to continue. But at any rate, is, um, is 50 plus could have percent. Done, like, in, Sorry, in the live stream, is there anything he could have done? Like, so he did obviously what he did in the live stream was if he wanted the stock to go up was not the right thing. I mean, he talked a bunch of craziness. He talked about the fundamentals of the stock. No one cares about the fundamentals of GameStop. I mean, I don't think any of these people are buying it as a turnaround play. Um, you know, this, this is a pure meme situation. 
But yeah. like, if, like some people had said, well, he was going to like exercise the options live on the live stream and catch the market makers off sides. Like, yeah, is there anything like that he could have done, or is it the, is everybody pretty much you know smart for this now? The problem with that was the the options were deep in the money. So in theory, if if in theory dealers were fully hedged at that point, right? Because the stock was the the stock was the, those he had the twenty strike options and the stock was at thirty five dollars, and so. On that basis, you you as a market maker would have to, had to have already bought tons and tons of shares to hedge that position, right? So if you did exercise, then the market makers in theory already have a bunch of stock and they just go, okay, Boring Kitty, here are the shares that we own already. So there wouldn't be incremental demand from that. Um, I think if he wanted to really do something, he would have rolled his calls up and out, right? So he has these deep in the money, you know, 20 strike calls that expire next week. Roll those out to eight, uh, to August at a higher strike because suddenly then you double the gamma exposure or triple or quadruple or however you want to do it. The gamma exposure and say, hey, I'm crippling down on my bet here. And that would have made everyone go crazy, I think, right? Because then you suddenly up the exposure a lot. And, and as the stock would start to rally there, then suddenly there's this explosion uh, of, of hedging flow that in theory would need to happen. Um, so I, I think he could have done something like that. You had guys like Dave Portnoy and all those other people super interested in what was going on with the stock. So, you know, doing anything that implied that you were doubling down or increasing your bet, uh, would have, you know, sparked, uh, sparked another fever. Right. But in this case, um, when he came out and just basically, I don't even know what he did. He kind of just, he like <laughs> made weird grunting noises. <laughs> I'm trying to recall well, in my well, mind how make the stock go up. I mean, yeah, was not what he he didn't do the right thing if he wanted the stock to go. No, and I don't think I don't know that he. Can, I think he just I I don't know. I don't want to get into his psyche. Um, it's not about money for him, right? Because he clearly would have he could have done a whole lot of other things that would have benefited him maybe a little bit more. Uh, but at any rate, um, he he's now you know on the sidelines for the moment. It seems like who knows what he's going to do. But I also think that if you think that he's going to pull some rabbit out of the hat in terms of some crazy, you know, short squeeze, ladder attack, whatever you want to call it, um, you don't have as much confidence in this now after, you know, you kind of lost your opportunity uh, last week. So at any rate, over half the gamma position now uh, and delta position, both of those positions expire in June. So it's a huge loss of the options trading complex in GameStop. Um I don't know what holds up the stock at this point because all else equal, they've diluted by adding another 75 million shares. So yes, the company has a couple more billion dollars of operating revenue that keeps them alive. I don't think they're going to zero, but why would it go over 30 at the moment? Uh, I don't really know. So that's yeah, the update we'll, to the GameStop. We'll switch saga. to the, your next slide here, but I, I would argue that you know that company might not even exist without all this stuff that's gone on because they, they've been selling stock into every one of these things. Yes. Um, yeah, and same for AMC, right? I mean, same for AMC. I mean, the, comp the behind the scenes, like as a fundamental guy myself, is not pretty with GameStop. The turnaround is not going well. Um, You're 100% um, so right. I don't know what would be, you know, they've tried to roll out. I don't know about GameStop specifically. I think they've, you know, played around some crypto, you know, uh, ideas. But but these companies are interesting because they need this retail public, right, to, to maintain this interest. And so I think they got to try to you know, maintain that positive, those positive vibes. But at the same time, they're, they are monetizing the retail public as fast as they can, right? Because those 75 million shares that get sold, I don't think it's a lot of institutions raising their hand and say, yes, please, me. Uh, they just know that there's a ton of liquidity because everybody and their brothers on Instagram or TikTok talking about buying GameStop. If you go look at YouTube videos, there's all these people just, they get a ton of views. I get jealous of those views because there's tons of views, but they're the worst takes on GameStop ever. And you just have to assume that it's the retail public getting fleeced. And so when you got to sell 75 million shares for GameStop at these, you know, all-time highs in the stock, it's the retail public that you need to keep the attention going that you're selling these shares to. So it's like, you know, it's like a form of self-abuse or something. It's it's just really, you know, for the retail people, it's just, it's bizarre. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You don't want to see, I mean, you don't want to see retail losing on this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I could tell you, you know, as a content provider and you put out, you know, goodwill, uh, <laughs> You know, saying, hey, this is what you should do, right? You should sell calls or you should try to do this or this is what you should watch for. That content generally doesn't, like like anything else, if a lie comes out and then the truth comes out after, the truth always gets way less views, right? It's like it happens in politics or basically anything else. And not necessarily that we're saying it's the truth, but it's just sort of like, hey, retail, like this is the, this is maybe a higher odds bet for you. Uh, it, it generally falls on deaf ears, so.
Yeah, Anyways, uh, so we'll we'll switch off. Uh, we've yeah. done enough GameStop, but uh, done enough yeah, GameStop. So in, in, in the true what's moving section in here, uh, you've, you've got a slide about uh, about correlations being snagged. Yeah, so we're translating from transitioning from one of the more retail topics of GameStop to a little bit more of an uh, institutional uh, topic of conversation. But one of the more interesting things happening now, it also happened back as you can see there in May, is that uh, excuse me, um, that would be May of last year. Correlations crashing, and what does that mean? That means that kind of the point of uh, IWM and Q performance, right, that we were just talking about, um, the stocks that are winning, right, or the stocks that are moving, the the correlation between those is breaking apart, right? So some stocks are going up a lot, some are going down. Uh, and while that generally happens, it's happening more than it normally does. And so the way that I always frame this is that if you think about March of 2020, right, everybody was dumping stock because the world was shutting down because of the COVID pandemic. All stocks are going down correlation jacked way up, right? Banks went down, uh, construction went down, cruise lines went down, everything went down. So that's correlation at its peak. Generally, when the market starts to rally and people get uh, have very positive views of equities, it starts to become a little bit more of a stock picker's market, right? I feel very comfortable owning equities here, but I really need to own NVIDIA because it's the best stock, right? I'm not worried about macro issues here. I'm worried about picking the best stock. And that's that's generally what people frame correlation as is, it's a stock picker's market. But in this case, you obviously have NVIDIA crushing it uh, and some of the other AI stocks doing very well, but then obviously things like small caps really fading or can't catch a bid, um, you know, retail stocks not doing that great, you know, things like that, right? The individual sectors are, are really dispersing. Now, what's interesting about this is that we hit one month lows here, or excuse me, all-time lows or, or, excuse me, let me restate that. We hit five-year lows in one month correlation. And this correlation metric specifically uses options that are one month in time, right, to measure this. So this is a forward-looking implied view of correlation. So we're back to 2017 levels in correlation. And I think that in front of this election and with everything else happening, I think we're going to touch those lows, not only correlation, but I think volatility as well. If you look at three-month correlations, so that's looking at options three months in time or six month, that's at all-time lows in correlation. So people just have a very limited view of risk in the, in, in the future. Um, as well as this idea that it's just these certain sectors that are con going to continue. Now, some of this, I think, the loan correlation is a view of the market. In other words, people, you know, when trades are working out, a la own NVIDIA and, and be maybe short everything else or not long everything else, that trade just keeps working. More flows reinforce that uh, view or the flows themselves, and that keeps the performance going in the direction, right? Correlation continues to go down, um, as you can see. But the second thing that comes to this is back to that volatility suppression video we talked about where you have these giant call overriding programs, you have these zero DTE flows, and I think what that does is it keeps the S&P 500 from moving at all. It locks the S&P in place, and then the individual components in the S&P 500 can move about, right? They're more free to move around. And so that also drives that correlation lower, right? Because when you have the index itself not moving, but the components moving a lot, that means that the correlation metric you see on your screen goes goes down. Um, so I know that was a mouthful. Uh, hopefully that that made sense. Yeah, and on, the, on this next slide with small caps, the struggle is real. I mean, we operate in the small cap value space, and these are some of our stuff. And like the more aggressive focused like ETFs in the small cap value space are down this year yeah. by a good amount. And you know what also was, was curious to me, like in terms of like people talking about bubble behavior and stuff, Arc is down 15, 20% this year, give or take. Yeah. Um, so like, it's just, it's an example of like, there's, there's all kinds of different things going on in this market right now. This is not like everything goes up, you know, we're, we're in this huge rally, you know, driven by everything. Even like the, the aggressive tech is down, the small cap value is down. It's, it's very different markets in different places. Yeah. And, and I would say that if you, you know, what, it, what is the growth story in the United States? I mean, if you talk about all of our problems, whether it's debt or high interest rates or you know, geopolitics and, 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 and growth and who's going to be the president and not. And, and, and there's all these different issues, right, that, that I think can weigh in so many things. But the AI growth story seems to trump all of that. And that seems to be the only major growth story that, that I'm aware of as kind of a, you know, a macro tourist, right? Um, everyone understands that story and those stocks are really outperforming. And that trumps the need for, uh, you know, capital and, and rates, you know, commercial real estate, is that going to survive small caps and some of these tech growth names that aren't the mega caps, you know, they don't, the funding at the rates they need, blah, blah, blah. 
And so I think that macro story makes out, you know, makes sense in some of the ways that correlation is showing up. To your point on ARC being at lows and not having even breaking down. Um, I would also say that ARC and IWM don't benefit from uh, these volatility suppressing flows of call overriding, right, in zero DT trading. Those that doesn't exist. That complex doesn't exist uh, for anything but the spies and, and to a smaller extent the Qs, right? IWM doesn't have an options complex that's anywhere near the same size. Uh, particularly with the call overriding, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons to um, both fundamental and kind of technical or positional, I would say, um, you know, that keep reinforcing the behaviors we've been seeing. So on your next slide, we finally got a inflation print that was below expectations uh, recently, and here it seems like all is well on the inflation front of for what you're seeing at least. Yeah, this is this is term structure. Uh, excuse me, this is one month skew, which shows the implied volatility values of one month options. And, and the takeaway here is that, you know, a couple of or a month ago at at May OPEX, uh, volatility was fairly elevated because people were worried about the FOMC and some of the upcoming inflation prints. Now volatility is chunked lower. We did have a little bit of a bid due to the the situation in in France. Um, you know, mild bits of the VIX has hold up, held up a little bit more than I would expect. Uh, but overall, people have basically said, look, you know, there's no near-term concerns around interest rates, right? The CPI, PPI, Fed speak, whatever it is, basically, at least in the very short term, we're talking one, two months out, you know, that's just not a, an issue for the moment. Um, and so I think it's going to continue to be that way. And then, you know, we'll we'll have to see if we get cuts or hikes or whatever after, I think after the elections, right? Unless we just get some kind of tail. I, I think, I mean, I'd like to ask you this question, Jack, but is there any situation here where they would raise rates uh, or cut before the election? I mean, I would think that would seem so political, right? It doesn't seem like it. Um, that's a, I know if I follow uh, Cullen Roche, I think he's been talking yeah. about this. Like yeah. It doesn't, it seems like if once they get, if they were going to do it, they would have done it earlier in the year and the yeah. data you know, the Fed's always backward looking, so they're just looking at whatever happened in the past and saying, like, what should we do? Um, so based on that, I mean, I think it would be unlikely they would want to cause any problems like right before the election or have people think they favor one candidate or the other. So and also the data is still kind of all over the place. So, yeah, I don't know that they have a compelling case to do either one of them anyway. Um, so it seems like probably the, the most likely scenario, we, like we had Bob Elliott on the podcast and we, we were asking him because everybody's all excited about what's the Fed going to do. And we're like, what is the Fed going to do? And he's like, absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, and, and it seems like that's probably what's going to happen, at least for now. You know, we're going to we're going to talk about the Fed meetings. But, you know, until after the election, nothing happens, I, mean, I guess. Yeah. And, and the inflation prints keep getting all this in, uh, attention right now. The, the the volatility assigned with those prints is, has contracted a fair amount. Um, and I just think that. I, I think that writ large, you have a situation where people are. Uh, you know, so much flow is short dated. Sorry, I'm stacking 12 ideas at once. So much flow now is short dated and, and selling volatility is such an alpha generator now or seen as an alpha generator now um, that there's this automatic movement to, to squash volatility as soon as it pops up just a little bit. And so many issues that we have now are, yeah, they're problems, but they're, they're not problems for next week or even next month, really, right? And so we can continue to sell this short dated vol and continue on these flows uh, cycling the way they are until the risks become more tangible. And so, you know, I think maybe, you know, uh, post-election, some of these risks will become more tangible, but, you know, that that's, you know, several months away, right? And so uh, what is materially going to break this cycle down in terms of, uh, you know, people wanting to own volatility and NVIDIA stop being the top stock or AI just stopping being the, same, you know, the top sector, et cetera. I think there's just very little to snap that cycle um, until we get maybe volatility in, in positions at a little bit more of an extreme. Like 2017, for example, what led to Volmageddon was realized vol at 3% and everyone, you know, trying to short the bet, right? And then suddenly in July, excuse me, January 2018, you have this spasm where, where everything broke because of that. Like, I don't think we're quite at that point where just the the positioning itself is enough to break the market. Um, you know, we're short term overextended in some of these various flows, I think. But, you know, what's going to be the trigger? It's got to be a macro credit positional trigger to break, you know, break down the cycle of things we're seeing and and for things to continue the way that they are. Um, I think that the establishment is happy to just keep things nice and calm before that election period is, is my guess. And so I think that will continue to be reflected in vault. 
And to your point about things continuing the way they are, we, you've got this next slide about the number of 2% moves. Um, we, we have not been having them. Yeah. So I don't know that I invented a chart type where there's a sawtooth chart. I'll show it to you in a second. Uh, but that chart is all over the place. Uh, I'll show you to you in a second. We made the Wall Street Journal, not our chart, unfortunately, our version of it. But uh, we've, we've sparked a, uh, a fad of showing that chart. But this is from early April. And we said that Volatility is starting to break out after record lows. Now, what's interesting about the April drawdown, and, and we're saying this in some hindsight here, is that we talked about correlation being very low, right? Um, and that meant that S&P doesn't really move, but the individual components are moving a lot in various directions. And April saw the S&P 500 draw down 5%, right? And the lows at April OPEX. But NVIDIA got just smoked. It was down 20% over that same period, right? And so the relative volatility remained extremely high, where, where S&P just kind of grinded lower. I mean, 5% is no joke, but relative to, you know, the leader of the free market, NVIDIA, uh, dropping 20%. So, you know, we had that correlation unwind. We got a sneak peek of that. And you can see correlation right here on this chart. This is the April spike. And I think that's the real, that's the short-term risk that we're running into here at April OPEX, where we just get NVIDIA dropping relative to the market and, and we get a little bit of this correlation breather before ultimately we make new lows in correlation. So back to the, the point of this, we had a record number of days. I think this streak is still on, as I'll show you. Uh, we're in the third largest stretch without a 2% uh, one day move in the S&P 500. What's interesting about the longest streak uh, that we've had, obviously 2006 was incredibly long, is we had 400 days into mid-February of streaks without a 2% gain the S&P. Do you remember what happened on February 22nd that broke the streak of giving us an S&P plus 2% move? I don't know. NVIDIA earnings. Okay. Uh, well, so there that's you go. a good guess. Yeah. Um, and what's so interesting about this, uh, we'll start with the decline. This is the chart I was just mentioning. SoFi and Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal retweeted this thing that we're now 329 days without a 2% drawdown on the S&P 500. Pretty remarkable, right? This is the second largest streak in the last 10 years. And you have to go, obviously, we're nowhere near the 2006 period of uh, 950 days uh, without a 2% drawdown. So, you know, this is a this is an amazing period of very low volatility. Um, but as I say here, is that it's just not about the drawdown. It's also about the rally. So here's that big streak that we just had of, of days without a 2% gain. Yes, 2017, note that 2017 coming up again, we had almost 350 days, right? But what's interesting is, and I hate adding caveats, but if you just pull out that one day we had because of NVIDIA earnings, you could add 70 days onto the current streak and then we'd be basically at uh, the second largest or, or longest streak in the last 10 uh, years, right? So this is a significant period of low volatility, of extremely low volatility. And you have to remember when we talk about volatility, that's movement up or down, right? There's just no vol in the S&P 500. Um, and, and it has to do with, Okay, there's central bank policies that, that suppresses volatility across all assets globally, but then I think you, you got to add on and pay attention to these uh, zero DTE flows, which bring mean reversion. We see it every day. And then this call overriding, which adds positive gamma to the market. Positive gamma hedging is dealers have to buy the dip in the S&P and they sell the, the rip in the S&P, and that makes trading ranges tighten down. Um, we saw that, right? And uh, European markets were down 2 3 4% last week. S&P did not care, did not bat an eye, uh, which is really unusual. To back that up, this is a chart hot off the press from Goldman here, which shows that rest of the world equities uh, have been a lot more volatile than the S&P. And you can see that volatility has really picked up just recently, right? And the spike here is due to the the Macron, you know, uh, issues that he's having. Uh, S&P volatility doesn't care, right? And and that's into this big OPEX week. Um, after OPEX, maybe you could start to care a little bit more. So yeah, so we're to close out here. We're going to talk about Nvidia, um, which is indeed we should because it's on everybody's mind right now. Um, so what are you seeing there? Um, on the yeah. Slide. Um, so we wrote our subscriber letter saying, look, uh, we're we're going to stick in an, we're going to stick a fork. We're calling a top in the relative outperformance of Nvidia. So what do I mean by that? Nvidia up forty percent. S and P is only up two. Um, I think that that performance gap is is just due. It's gotten too big, right? And it's and it's going to start to fall more in line with with the other market. I'm not. I think AI is still could could generate revenues. Could Nvidia's market cap be higher in a year from now? I think that's totally reasonable. But this this thing where it outperforms the the market writ large at such a magnitude, I think 
you know, I, I think it's it's time uh, it's time for that to come to an end. And I have a couple of reasons for that. Number one here is you can see I normalized 10 day realized volatility, so very short term volatility. And what you can see here is that over time these two track on a normalized basis. It's pretty close. There's a little bit of noise around earnings. Typically, is what you see these jumps. But you'll notice that these peaks and valleys for Nvidia Vol on a relative basis have really picked up recently, right? And when I was talking about the leverage in NVIDIA, well, both with the you know, explicit leverage of options and 3x ETFs, there's a 5x NVIDIA ETF in London. So this is a global phenomenon. Um, that's adding a lot of extra volatility. Now that volatility has been pointed up, right? NVIDIA ripping to the upside um, and all this momentum factor. You can see that there's, there's a lot of extra relative volatility. This is a view of the correlation trade in some way. Uh, but I think this is spasms happening before at some point that vol has got to come back in line with the with the market writ large, right? And that's that's essentially what I'm trying to say here. But that vol cannot come back in line with the market writ large until I think there's a drawdown, right? You got to have a nasty drawdown for the thing to normalize. Well, this is, uh, I call this NVIDIA dry, drying up. There are a ton of lies on this chart. Um, and so I apologize to the viewers here, but what you have is call and put open interest for NVIDIA here in purple is call open interest. Yellow is put open interest. There's a couple of interesting things here. Number one is historically put open interest. And this chart's going back to early 2022. In 2022, we had higher put open interest, right? And that's not surprising because that market was weak, but put open interest was by and large, larger, higher. There's more puts in NVIDIA than calls, um, for all of you know, the last two years up until call it January of 2024. And then you could see how much more calls came into the market, right? And so calls have, have been at the sustained basis larger. And that tells us that there's just all this demand. But look at the outperformance of NVIDIA, right? It's like it hits the turbochargers at that same time and the performance just goes off the charts. You can also see that in call volume. Call volume much higher than put volume uh, on a relative basis, but also the volumes this year in NVIDIA just much higher, right? You can see just as, as the stock took off in January, options volume just ripped along with that call open interest. What's interesting to me is this most recent period around the stock split. You can see that there's a spike in volume, right, with the split, but then volume last week dropped. Now, I, the reason I showed a Bloomberg chart here is because when you split the stock, it can do weird things to options. And are you, you know, do you look at it on a split base? volume, you know, you adjust for the splits, do you adjust open interest for the splits, et cetera. So there's a lot of noise in this. Even if what I would have thought is stock splits and that invites this retail public who all come in and buy options, right? And they all start day trading this thing. Any way you cut it, that volume is now dropped, right? And and the open interest seems to be decreasing as well. These aren't major decreases, but that that seems to be drying up. And I also just look at the stock volume this past week. Now one week doesn't make a trend. But, but that was a very low volume week last week. And it wasn't a holiday week. It was a split week. There was FOMC. There's tons of stuff going on. But it feels like it's running out of gas a little bit, right? Uh, that's what I get from these charts, which I think are, are really very interesting. Um, the other thing I did here is, you know, before we had this chart called the waiting game where the market was waiting for inflation in video print, this is called the waiting game as in how heavy something is. This is a, uh, a scatter plot of NVIDIA one-day returns on the x-axis and S&P returns on the y-axis. Now, you can see that historically, this black line shows you that there's a pretty linear relationship over time, right? NVIDIA goes up, S&P goes up. We would all expect that relationship. What was interesting is in April, which are these blue x's, and you can see the blue regression line, NVIDIA started to really decouple from the market, right? You could see that, and a lot of this was expressed down the most famous day that I flag here is this blue X to the left where NVIDIA lost 10%. On the same day, the S&P only lost about 8%. It was one of the nastiest drawdowns it's had uh, in the last five years, which is what this data shows you, right? Um, and then similar to the upside, you know, NVIDIA would be ripping to the upside, but the S&P would be pretty, pretty quiet. Now, in May, what happened was after April OPEX, all of that rebounded, right? All of a sudden, NVIDIA picked picked back up, S&P grinded back higher. So that 5% drawdown that we were talking about in April got erased pretty quickly, but so did the 20% drawdown in NVIDIA. And so again, that outperformance happened to the upside. So that 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 relationship seemed to flatten out even more. And then in June, you can see it seems to be shifting a little bit again. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because 
just like that volatility chart where you could see it seems like the wheels are kind of coming off the relationship a little bit. That's what this regression seems to speak to me as well, where NVIDIA is no longer having any relationship to the S&P 500, even though it's six plus percent, you know, of the index itself. Um, it's really just decoupled from reality in a, in a very uh, in a very strange way that I think doesn't have anything to do with fundamentals. It has to do with positional issues, right? How big these momentum trades are, options complex, you know, it's waiting in the various indices. And this next one, you're looking at how big the open interest is, right, in NVIDIA. It's absurd. Um, now, this is our, our latest spreadsheet, and, and I want to tell them how they get this spreadsheet after this quickly here. But what I did here is I, I, I pulled down the current options uh, complex with a bunch of different stats. And what you can see here is NVIDIA has 36 million contracts. I went to three different data vendors, vendors to make sure that I read this right because it was so strange to me. So it has 18 million calls and open interest. That's the largest of any complex. So it's bigger than the SPX, it's bigger than the spiders, it's bigger than the queues. It's number one in terms of call open interest. It is also the largest in put open interest as well. But those put don't have a ton of value, right? Because it's all in the money calls. You can see here that the largest delta expiration. So if you if you if you uh, assign an options relative or if you equate sorry, let me restate that. Uh, what the delta expiration tells us is you can use delta to measure how big an option is in stock terms, right? So, you know, if you want to know how big the options complex is relative to stock, you measure it in what's called delta, delta notional terms that gives you a, an estimation there. So most of the delta is expiring on 621. This is this Friday. Um, and it is, I'm going to show you a chart on this. It is the biggest call delta complex. It is the most call deltas of anything, uh, except for the SPX, which is really just shocking to me. So what you see here again is um, total open interest in NVIDIA, 36 million contracts. The next largest is the SPX that has 23 million contracts. Obviously, the notional in SPX is much bigger. But spiders have 20 million contracts. So NVIDIA is bigger than all of these. Um, and so your next question, you go, hey, Brent, is this unique? Uh, and I would say, indeed, it is. Uh, this chart here shows you the value. In a, and this is a five-day moving average. Just took a little bit of the noise out. This is a five-day average of call delta notional for the top stocks uh, over the last two years. What you can see here is in this teal color is spiders. NVIDIA now has a more call delta value than spiders, which is really stunning to me. Um, it has, what is this, 2x, I would say, uh, not quite 2x of the Q value, uh, call value. And it has, if you added up the call value across Apple, Google, Microsoft, and even Tesla, that wouldn't add up to be the current size of the NVIDIA complex. So the fact that the uh, NVIDIA has larger call delta notional value than spiders, it's the first time this has happened uh, since early 2021 when you could say, hey, this is when the options complex really picked up. To me, that suggests an extreme level of bloat. Now, has this happened before? People would ask, not with NVIDIA, not anywhere close, but we did see this happen with Tesla. I apologize for the, call, for the colors here on your chart, but what you can see is that in mid to late 2021, remember... This is when SoftBank was buying calls and Tesla was splitting and Apple was splitting and then Tesla got added to the S&P 500 and it created this fever for Tesla stock. And what you can see here is that uh, the peak for this occurred roughly in and around November of 2021, which is exactly the high in the stock when it got added to the S&P 500 complex. NVIDIA, uh, excuse me, Tesla topped out at $400 per share on a split adjusted basis on, uh, it was like November 3rd, 2021. And that's right when this sort of call complex peaked as well, right? And, and then the stock came down. Obviously, Tesla's had a lot of problems since then. So this to me tells me that it's not just this situation of Brent trying to say, hey, this is where my feelings are. This has gone crazy. You can see it in the options complex, right? That NVIDIA suddenly now is so much larger than everything else. And its market cap is nowhere near, obviously, spiders or uh, uh, Apple or Microsoft, right? It's just, it's just not that big, but the call positions now have gotten to be larger than anything else in existence. Uh, it's really remarkable to me. And I think it, it, it is a flag of, okay, uh, we, we've peaked now, right? The, the relative performance on a relative basis, you know, we're, we're due for some consolidation. Yeah. It'll be really interesting to see how this plays out. I'm sure we'll talk about this in, in future episodes. Um, it, it's something really people are really interested in, and it's like you said, it's an extreme situation. So uh, yeah, yeah, I'll be I'll be really interested to see how how this plays out going forward. Yeah, um, and so I talked a lot about the vault suppression video. I don't know why the marketing people goofed on me and put this as the picture for the video, but they did. 
It's a very bad picture if you're only listening to it. It generates the higher click-through rates, Brenton. Uh, apparently. Uh, you could you could say that. Uh, not very flattering. Uh, but go check out that video because it talks about correlation and dispersion, a lot of these factors that uh, led to a violent unwind in April, but now we're back to those same values. And I think we're going to get somewhat of a violent, possibly unwind for like NVIDIA here in the next couple of weeks. And then ultimately that correlation trade is going to go back the same way. And I think we're going to target the 2017 lows is my guess. Second thing is just quickly, if you wanted to get that spreadsheet that I mentioned before, uh, maybe Jack, you can include a link in this, but there's a, there's a, uh, at spotgamma.com, you can download the OPEX spreadsheet that we showed, which shows you how big all the call positions and put positions are for NVIDIA. Uh, versus all the other stocks. And then we're going to do a special uh, Q&A on Tuesday afternoon that if you download the spreadsheet, you get a special invite to that, where we're going to talk about some of the ways you can actually trade this. And so I think that'll be pretty interesting for everybody. Again, that'll happen tomorrow afternoon, which will be uh, Tuesday. So uh, we look forward to doing that. Yeah, and I'll put I'll put a link to that as well as the full presentation um, in, in the show notes for this. Um, yeah, we went we went a little long this time, but we had so, we had so much good stuff. Uh, and I, I kind of threw that GameStop uh, thing on you last minute, but I was I think a lot of people were just interesting what's going on behind the scenes. So uh, yeah, well, you know, sometimes the market doesn't give you much to talk about. Like May was pretty quiet, right? And I think we we're a little bit shorter. Uh, a lot of interesting things to talk about here. A lot of fascinating flows shifting around, and uh, we certainly look forward to giving a recap of what happened in July. Thank you, everybody, everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next week or next month, actually. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Thanks, everybody. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Olivia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Olivia Capital.